Hi, welcome to this um, free webinar on common school issues or common school um, questions that I get. Um, my name is Lindsay Kennedy Wood. I'm the Education Consultant at Down Syndrome Queensland. So today we're just going to be talking about a few of the um, of the areas that can be of concern for people and um, have been brought up to our attention. So. There's going to be four areas we're going to look at. We're going to look at social connections, community involvement, social stories, the importance of social stories, and um, the ICP, ISP, P PLP, the acronym for, you know, that, that program that they might put in place to help your, uh, to help a student along the way. So let's start with social connections. So the opposite of social connections, obviously, is social isolation, and that's the absence of social relationships, i.e. friendships. Unfortunately, we know people with a disability are more susceptible to, um, to social isolation than others, and the effects on this can be highly detrimental to um, the individual and have long-term effects on them. So socialise... Social isolation has um, shown to have physical and mental implications for the individual and it can lead to things like depression, obviously loneliness, which then can lead to things like obesity, um, risky behaviour like excessive drinking, smoking, drug use to try and combat that loneliness and hypertension such as um, high levels of stress and blood pressure issues. It's also um, shown to create a shorter lifespan for the individual, has detrimental effects on their mental uh, their mental cognition, so it can lead to de early dementia. And we already know that um, individuals with Down syndrome are more predisposed to dementia, so we want to do everything we can to stop um, that happening. And um, also just with health, it can mean that they're not as healthy or it takes them longer to get better or they're more susceptible to illness and that type of thing. So conversely, being socially connected is important for all humans, whether, you know, regardless of ability. And it's been shown to improve our mental health. It increases our sense of connection and belonging because obviously we have a place where we feel that we fit in. It increases our happiness, our confidence and self-worth. It provides a support network so when life gets tough, we know where we can go or who we can rely on. It increases our life expectancy because we have things to live for. We have things that we're excited about. We have things that we want to go to, that type of thing. It teaches us values, knowledge and skills, social skills especially. So values and knowledge, we tend to be friends with people who are like us or have the same values as us. Um, obviously, it builds on knowledge through conversations and that type of thing and we learn social skills through our interactions, our conversations and that type of thing. And as a conglomerate, it builds a community of, um, of, sorry, a culture or community of acceptance of understanding. So the acceptance of, you know, everyone's a little bit different um, and that's okay. Um, there's no such thing as normal. So, um, you know, there's when when me and my family talk about, oh, you know, the normal family, there's no such thing as a normal family. There's no such thing as a normal person. Um, so it's building that culture of acceptance and understanding that we're all different, we all belong, and we can all work together. And let's be honest, social connections are fun. A lot of the people um, get stimulated through social connections. They get um, revived through social connections as well. So when we're thinking about students, um, our students in particular, um, what do they want? Well, they want to be seen like everyone else. They want to be able to play with their friends. They don't want to be isolated to a certain area of the classroom or a certain area of the school, which happens quite a bit, where they have to go play in a special place because that's the place where they're going to be safe. But um, we want they want to be able to play with who they choose to play with, their peers, their friends. They want to have um, age-appropriate experiences like going to the air car. They want to go on school excursions. They want to go on the school camp. They want to go um, camping with their family. And they want to have genuine friendships. They want to be able to go to birthday parties. The amount of conversations they have with parents who aren't invited to the classroom party where every other child was invited or they want to go to the Friday night disco or um, have play dates on the weekend or after school dates and that type of thing. They want to have the genuine relationships. 
So a child is influenced by lots and lots of people around them. And at the core of who influences our children or our, us as individuals are at the young age, are our family, our peers and our school. So you can understand how those social connections with our family are pretty much a given in most families, but school and peers and sometimes children with a disability struggle in the area of school and peers because they're seen as different. They're isolated from their peers, they can be separated, segregated um, to a different area, to a different room, that type of thing. So we've got to make sure that um, we're setting the culture early and um, that they do have those connections. As you can see, as the bubbles go out or the circles go out, there's different connections that we get. But the peer, peer um, core of where we get our um, connections from is from our family, our school and our peers. And these are the ones that um, affect our students the most. So what do we need to remember? Well, for our students, social connections aren't a given. They need to be helped, they need to be discussed, they need to be explicitly taught. That's where later on we'll talk about social stories. Social stories are an important way. They need to be um, taught what's what's right and wrong behaviour. We know that students with um, an intellectual impairment can mimic the students around them. So if they're not making good peer choices, they're going to potentially make bad behaviour choices, which is then going to be seen as a negative social connection and um, discouraged, but we need to help them to have those positive social interactions so they can have strong um, friendships and relationships. I know of um, several teenagers who have gone through school and are still friends with their friends from prep and still see them and interact with them and that type of thing, have play dates with them still because the relationships were cultivated so early on that um, and they were taught and explicitly taught that those students have continued to be friends. Students need to understand that not everyone is the same and we're all different. We all have different hair colour, eye colour, aptitude, skills, um, different family lives. We come from different parts of the world, that type of thing. And we can't assume that everyone has been taught the, the morals of right or wrong and that's for every child. We need to explicitly teach that, you know, this is the way that the world is. And um, one of the things that I find the most beneficial is put, having students put themselves in the other person's shoes and to see it from their perspective. How would you feel if blah, blah, this happened to you? How would you feel and have them put themselves emotionally in that spot so that they can um, f understand how it's upsetting if they're not included or you're isolated or you're separated from your friends and that type of thing. No one wants to be um, separated from their friends and that type of thing. So how can educators help? Well, we need to build a relationship ourselves with our students. We need to show interest. We need to learn how they operate, what, what, what are their triggers, what do they, what calms them down, what are their likes and dislikes, what's their life circumstance, what's it like in their house, their family, do they, you know, have easy access to food or is, is money a bit tight in their family? Um, do they have good relationships with people around them, that type of thing? We need to help foster peer relationships, so making sure that um, they have a connection with their peers and that's through helping them find common interests and points of connection, helping them by explicitly teaching them how to have a conversation or how to start a game, that type of thing. Building empathy for others and this is across the whole class, this isn't specific to the child with the disability, this is for every child. We need to help them to build empathy for others. So help them to put themselves in the other person's shoes, like I said. Create a culture of understanding that not everyone's the same. Not everyone's going to be as good as me at such and such, but I'm not going to be as good as someone else at such and such. And that's okay. Set clear and consistent rules. So have rules that you expect of all the class. Have the same expectations of every student in your class. Don't have different expectations because you have an understanding that that might be tricky for them. Get to know the student and just, and when you set the expectation, most students are going to rise to the challenge and hit your expectation. Be intolerant of discrimination. As soon as anyone brings any sort of discrimination or bullying or derogatory talk to mind, step on it. 
explain that that's not acceptable and it will not be tolerated within your classroom, your school, your environment and um, hold yourself to that as well. Um, hold everyone accountable, including other teachers, by making sure that you have a community expectation. So the best way to um, build a culture of inclusion is to start top down. So the principal, the deputy principals, um, the inclusion coaches, everyone down from there needs to have exactly the same expectation. It needs to be a culture of acceptance, a culture that everyone is held to and that anyone who doesn't abide by needs to be um, discussed with them and, 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 and brought up to speed on this is the culture at our school, this is what we um, believe that every child or every individual can be a part of the community, accepted and um, loved wholly. Understand your role. So if you're a teacher, if you're a teacher aide, if you're um, the inclusion coach, if you're a deputy or a principal, understand what your role is in that. That if you're the teacher, you're in charge of your classroom. So you need to make sure your classroom culture is set. If you're the teacher aide, then, you know, when you've got a group of students, you set the culture of that group of students. If you're the principal, you've got to set the culture of not only the school, but the surrounding community as well, have an impact upon them. And treat everyone as important and with fairness and with the same expectations. So if you're expecting everyone to be nice to each other, there's no expect, there's no exception to that, that everyone needs to be nice to each other. Everyone needs to use their manners. Everyone needs to, um, look out for each other. Um, if someone falls over, we look, um, um, we look out for each other, that type of thing. So, that's how we can help with um, social inclusion. What about the broader concept of community involvement? So community involvement is also important for individuals, all individual, all individuals, but it's even so, it's even more so for individuals who are likely to require a significant amount of support during their lifetime. So that's, you know, students who have physical disabilities, students who have mental disabilities, they might have intellectual disabilities or they might have mental in in uh, disabilities as well. Um, students with Down syndrome, that type of thing. Um, it ha the reason we want people to be involved in the community because um, it helps us to feel a sense of connection with others and it helps us know where we fit in society and provides us with support systems when we need it. So for, for our students, community involvement is one area of school but it goes further than that and it's about um, understanding uh, mindsets and misconceptions of um, individuals. I'm just going to show you this short video. It has been um, edited because it did have some unsavory language in it, but I've taken that out. And this is just a video of um, a day in the life of someone with an adult with Down syndrome. And just watch, as you watch, just think about some of the mindsets and the misconceptions that might be evident within it. Hi Stephen, you ready to go? Hey, Hi, Steve. How are you? Good, Good thanks. To see you. How are you? Oh, I didn't know you. Uh... I'm Stephen. Thank you to watch me. Elsie, you're such an angel to be doing this work. You must be so patient. Well, well done anyway, yeah? I'll see you later, OK? What's that about? Well, some people seem to think there's something special about supporting people with disabilities just to do the same things that everyone else does. Oh, how interesting. I really need some toilet rolls. Should we go to the shop before we go to the cinema? Yeah. Hello, young man. You've been doing your shopping. Well done, you. What have you got? Uh, toilet rolls. Wow, you have bought your own toilet rolls. You must feel so proud of yourself. You are an inspiration. I am so inspired by you. Is this for real? Uh, 
I just think some people find it hard to understand that people with disabilities can do things independently. Explain that one to me. When you have a disability, especially a visually recognisable one like Down syndrome, I think sometimes people see you as an eternal child and they see you doing things like drinking alcohol, smoking, swearing, and they just get upset about it. Hi guys, how are you? Oh, good, thanks. Two tickets to Born Again, please. Born Again, that'll be uh, seven pounds. Stephen's paying. Oh, oh, right. Uh, seven pounds. Thank you. Here's your three pounds change. That's my money, my change. Right, sorry. Okay, so that's one pound, two pounds, and that's three pounds change in total. Keep that safe, okay? Here's your two tickets. Oh, um, here, here's your tickets, okay? Well done. I enjoy the film. Oh, oh, wait, guys, did you manage to get your van into the disabled parking space? Uh, I don't drive. Don't you hate it when people use those spaces when they don't need them? <laughs> no, we walk. Oh, look, there he is. Stay. Right. Yeah, that's it. 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 Yeah, Cheers. Cheers. Why not to drink this? Yeah, why not? Cheers. I really love that video because it really showcases some of the, the um, misconceptions that society have um, for, for individuals, adults and things with Down syndrome that they can't be independent, that they can't, they can't um, live a productive and full life, which is just totally wrong. But what I want um, to ask the question is, and the answers are there so you can see them, but why is communication, um, community participation important? Like, People, individuals in society think, oh, you know, if I include the, the, the person with a disability, I'm doing the right thing or I'm a good person or I'm going to include them because it's the law or, um, you know, if I don't include them, then they're going to whinge and moan at me um, and it's better to oil the squeaky wheel, so to say, than to have to listen to someone whinging the whole time. Um, but the reality is, is it's a basic human right that every individual, regardless of ability or disability, needs to be included in every, in every area of community. And if that involves the community changing so that they can um, access it, that means the community needs to change, the group might need to change, the, um, the, the place where they meet might need to change because it needs to be accessible to everyone, and that is the basic human right of all individuals. So what are some of the pers what are some of the barriers to our to our children? And when I'm talking community um, participation, if you're from a school, I'm talking about a school. I'm talking about a sports club. I'm talking about girl guides, boy scouts. I'm talking about every area where a child can participate. I'm talking about after school care. We've had after school cares that have denied access to our students. Um, I'm not just talking about community as in friendships, although they're important, I'm talking much more broadly than that. So what are some of the areas that we can find barriers? Well, in the personal areas, we can find things like they might have poor health, 
they might have um, or they might have heart issues or sight and that type of thing issues they might have poor mobility they might be in a wheelchair they might struggle to walk upstairs they might um, struggle to get from place to place without assistance um, support they might need support to just understand so you saw that the man in the video had a support worker with him at all times didn't really need him there but they just wanted that support they might lack the confidence because of past experiences, past things that have happened to them, or just they don't really understand what's going to happen, so their confidence is a bit low. It's like starting a new job. When you start a new job, you struggle with your confidence often because you're walking into a new place. And the other side is money. They might not have you know, an, an, an unending amount of money as none of us do. So that might be a barrier as well. Societal barriers include things like we saw in the video, like wrong perceptions. The the man who spoke to him when he came out of the um, the shopping centre was like, "Oh, well done, you!" As if it was like it was just the wrong perception to have. These um, he was totally independent. That's totally acceptable. But his but the old man's perception was, "Oh, you need help. You've started." You've given it a good go. So again, the perceptions, the attitudes of people, the accessibility of, of places. So if a place doesn't have a lift or it doesn't have a ramp and that type of thing, is it not accessible to the individual? Um, transport and distance. So a lot of um, our students can struggle to understand how to, um, how to um, gain access to and access and um, move about on public transport like buses and trains. So if, if the community participation or the thing they want to do or the group they want to do is a long way away, they might have issues with actually um, gaining access to it through the fact that they're just too far away from it. The other thing is they might need um, a, a taxi to pick them up in the afternoon or things like that. And then just information, they might not be, be giving, be being given all the information they need to understand when to be there, what they need to bring, um, what's expected of them, that type of thing. So sometimes there's a decimation of uh, a lack of information given as well. And then the systemic barrier. So the availability, the availability of required supports to make it happen. So some schools will say we don't have a teacher aid, so we don't have supports to put in place. So they can see that as a barrier. Um, or we don't have the resources we need, so that's a required support. Um, and often that's due down to things like money and that type of thing. But there's ways around that type of thing. And with the introduction of the NDIS, a lot of the systemic um, availability of required supports has dropped because our um, individuals are now able to access some of those required supports through that. And then just access to the education employment. So schools rejecting enrollment of an individual with um, a disability. There's there's low levels of employment in individuals with a disability, all disabilities. Um, so that can be systemic too. And, and again, that comes back to the perceptions and attitudes of society and the people in charge and that type of thing as well, if it's not considered um, in the employment arena. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see down the bottom there's a, um, a link to a where this was um, taken from and some of the barriers. So if you want some more information, you can head to there. Right, purposeful participation. So you know we don't we don't want people to participate in community things because it's filling their time and you know, otherwise they'll be bored during the week or they need to have things to do. Um, purposeful participation should be um, organic, it should be allowed to involve, it should be chosen specifically for the individual so it's have a purpose. So if they're learning social skills, it should build on the future goals and visions of those social skills. Money, it might be around money so they can learn life skills, it might be around um, being able to catch public transport. So um, we do courses on, you know, this is how you catch public transport or life skills or, you know, that type of thing. Or it might be around soccer because they've got a passion for soccer or football. Um, it needs to be chosen specifically to suit the individual that it's targeted towards. It needs to increase their enjoyment, their participation, their sense of belonging. So it's building upon um, all of those areas so it's not just again that whole idea well we'll just put them here because it gives them something to do on a Wednesday. It needs to be culturally significant so um, 
if they're an Indigenous individual, they might do something around Indigenous education or Indigenous um, outreach. If it's something to do with, they might be um, doing, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it, the Islet, Irish dancing. Oh, no, I forgot the name of it, but you know what I mean. So, you know, because it's culturally significant who they are and they're learning about their heritage and that type of thing. Building connections, obviously, you know, through the organisation and the individual, so giving them that social outlet and increase their skill set and lifelong learning. So we, when we're creating personal, um, purposeful participation, we're really thinking about the individual and whether it's going to be beneficial to them longitudinally as well, not just a filler for their day. All right, social stories, and I love that picture. Um, so social connections don't come easily, as I stated previously, and we need to give offer guidance and direction when trying to educate our, um, individuals on social skills, and this is best done through social through the use, through the use of social stories. So some of the social skills that um, may be undeveloped or may need um, honing can include things like initiating, maintaining and terminating interactions or conversations, forming and um, maintaining friendships, um, re receiving and responding to situational cues, recognising and expressing feelings appropriately and identifying what might be their catalyst, what might be the warning sign for them. Understanding honesty and fairness, that, you know, fair doesn't always mean that everyone gets the same thing. Fair is getting what you need to be able to um, access or be able to um, reach on the same level as others. Learning social rules, customs, that type of thing, you know, not jumping into conversations, not saying, saying please and thank you, um, just what's acceptable and that's different depending on what country you're in and that type of thing as well. Starting and maintaining conversations, um, rights and responsibilities, their body awareness and personal space, that can be an issue for some students, they'll get right in individuals face and that can be quite threatening for others. So we need to teach them about body awareness and that. Um, problem solving, conflict resolution, so what to do when a conflict arises and how to resolve it. Um, assertiveness and then keeping safe. So just social, they the social skills and the best way to do it is through a social stories. It's a concrete way to improve their understanding of difficult situations and is used to describe social situations to define the appropriate behaviour. It's personalised to whatever is needed and it targets one specific behaviour at a time. So it's important that we only teach one because our students or our, our family members with Down syndrome do have an intellectual disability so therefore it takes them longer to remember things and the more things we give them to try and remember the more likely they are to confuse what we're trying to tell them and jumble it up and actually get it completely wrong. So you target one situational behaviour at a time. Once that situational behaviour has been um, understood and you've seen it actioned out then you can move on to the next one. You need to explicitly teach it repeatedly until the desired behaviour is observed because once is never enough. Um, again, they take longer to retain the knowledge. They might need to be walked through it several times and then you slowly remove the scaffolding. Um, obviously, you know, um, with time they might forget certain aspects of it so you keep the social story and it's something that can be revisited when needed and it's always framed in the positive so we don't, we don't, we try not to use the negative when we're stating a social story. I do have some examples so don't stress um, but um, obviously with a child with Down syndrome or any child, um, I would make sure that the social story is very visual and you would put visuals of them in the social story because they're more likely to assimilate it to themselves when they can see themselves in the social story. So we personalise it to the situation, make it as personal as we can around what you're hoping to see of that particular child because each child is different and obviously it's tailored to um, whatever the situation they're in or the environment they're in and that type of thing. So I've got 
um, a social story I made with a little girl named Sophie. So Sophie um, struggled to sit on the mat. She was always touching her friends, um, playing with their hair, um, calling out. And so we did a social story. So this is a social story about Sophie sitting on the mat. It's very simple. The text is simple. There's a picture of her. So she sees herself in the correct position at all times. So never am I going to put a picture that shows what she shouldn't do because as soon as I show her a picture of what she shouldn't do, she's going to remember that picture and mimic it. So I want to always make sure that the picture's of her and she is just adorable. So this is a social story about Sophie sitting on the mat. Now it's quite, it's very simple. There's not much to it because I don't want to overload her with words or anything like that. The picture's just on a white background so she's not focusing on anything else and there's a picture of her. So on the mat I cross my legs and there's a picture of Sophie with her legs crossed. I put my hand in my hands in my lap and I listen to what is being said. So there she is. She's listening. She's got a smile on her face, um, but she's not touching anyone else. She's not interrupting. If I have a question, I can put my hand up and wait for the teacher to say my name. So there she is with her hand up, waiting patiently so she can see herself. And if I do this, my teacher will be happy with me. Very simple, very short but to the point and that's the expectation that I have. I'm going to incorporate that with a reward chart because Sophie is young and I'm going to give her that positive reinforcement of when she does that, she gets a sticker. Then once she's got so many stickers, so I would say three, she would then get a positive re reward of what she would choose. So it might be um, a colouring in sheet, it might be Play-Doh, it might be um, a little play in the um, sensory box, that type of thing. So that's one we made. There's lots of different ones that are available on Pinterest and, and Teachers Paid Teachers. Um, the only issue I have with any of those um, is that they're not specific to the child. So they do go through lots of different um, ideas. So this one's obviously what's okay and not okay to put in my mouth. Um, obviously, um, if you've got a sensory tactile a child who's got sensory issues then something like this might work but I would again if you're going to use the words I would um, zone out the pictures with pictures of the actual individual so there's different examples and you'll notice that in the picture of the pencil that's been chewed there's no child so the picture is of the child eating the apple which is okay or the child is of the picture of eating the cookie which is okay but the child is not chewing on the pencil so the child doesn't see a child chewing pencil and think it's okay we can see that it's not okay type thing there's also social stories for, you know, events that might be happening. So going camping with the family, that can be a trying time for some of our students because it's a different environment. It feels different. There's different noises. Um, we're not at home where the comfort is. So, you know, there's stories around that. And again, we can um, take out those photos and put photos of our own in. There's also photos around feelings and situations. So a fire drill, this is what we do in a fire drill. Sometimes I feel frustrated or upset. I understand that, you know, Sometimes we don't have time to make social stories pertinent to our children, but if it's a behaviour that's an issue, then you do need to take that time to make sure that the student is aware of that it's about me, I need to be doing this so they can see themselves. And the last one to think about is events that the student might go to. So things like camps. So it's important that if you're going to take a child on a camp, and this isn't just a child with, a, um, with Down syndrome, this is a child with autism or a child who has separation anxiety or any of those sort of things. You know, what am I going to see? What am I going to feel at, on the excursion or on the camp? What will my day look like? Who will I maybe be with? That type of thing. Um, so that they've got that security to know. And things like getting a haircut, haircuts can be very trying, or an injection, um, going to the dentist. So there's lots of social stories that we can be using for lots and lots of different in, um, situations. If you're wanting more information on social stories or you want help with writing them, get in touch with us. Otherwise, you know, do some research, have a look on things like Pinterest and Teachers Pay Teachers and those types of um, platforms and you might find something that is usable for your situation. All right, 
The next area we're going to look at is ICPs, ISP. So these are the individual student programs or um, the individual curriculum programs. You might have heard of a PLP, a personalized learning program. Used to be an IEP, an individual educational program. So we're just going to talk generally about this because they're very specific to the child. Um, and underneath the umbrella of all of these, um, you can ask questions of me at any point around them. Um, they are a legal document, so once they've been written and signed, then the school is legally obligated to um, follow um, the goals that are set in there, and you should always be involved in them. I'm saying that as you're a parent. If you're a parent, you should be involved in the planning. If you're a teacher, you should absolutely be involved in the planning. But if you're a parent, then you should be involved in the planning, and if appropriate, the child should be included too. So if you're looking at a child in year four or above, I would be hoping that that child would be involved in that planning of that meeting and putting some um, some of their ideas towards the goals that they want. So documented plans include any of these um, and more. So that's it's never ending, and um, state schools versus private schools have different ones, and you know school to school can have different ones as well. But when we're looking at document mentored plans, the purpose is to provide a meaningful education plan appropriate to the student's skill set. There should be targeted learning goals that are attainable. There should be, and that's if they're doing a curriculum plan. Um, the learning goals might not be learning goals. They might be um, adjustments and care and self-care type goals around adjustments that they need, so specific and diverse adjustments. So if you've got a child who's not toilet trained, they're going to have a self a self care or a personal care goal in there as well. And they might that might be on the individual student plan rather than an individual curriculum plan because the only thing that will be on the curriculum plan are the changes in the curriculum or the educational setting stuff that they're doing. And an individual curriculum plan is normally when a child is working on a separate age curriculum to their peers. So it might be that your child is in year three or a child is in year three, but they operate at a prep level. Therefore, they should still be accessing the same curriculum, but they will show their understanding at a prep level and that will be all documented in that ICP. ISP tends to be more of the, the social connections, the health and wellness, um, the access, that type of thing. Um, there can be long-term goals of the student and the family involved as well as short-term goals. And I always say to parents and families, it's really great to have a vision statement um, available during these meetings to remember the purpose that you're there for. You're there for this child because you want them to be a loving and contributing member of society or you want them to be able to communicate with their peers you know what is your long-term goal so we always say you know if you don't have a vision statement for your child write one and there's free downloads on our website where you can access um, a template to fill in for your family it should be a meeting that col that collaborates ideas and understandings and positives and areas of concern between the home and the school so it should be a positive um, engagement and unfortunately sometimes they're not positive but it's important that you always keep in mind why you're there which is why having that vision statement available and a picture of the student on the table is often advisable. It, um, it outlines what the responsibilities of the individuals involved in the plan are and um, often it gives um, res specific responsibilities to a specific person, so it's outlining who's responsible for what, so it's making accountability. And it doesn't have to include every learning area, so some of them will only include things like maths and English, especially the curriculum ones, because the student might be able to access the same curriculum and perform at the same level as their peers in things like science and HASS and drama and that type of thing. When they're writing a goal, um, a goal should be a smart goal, so it should be specific. It should ex specific. It should explicitly name the skill they're going to achieve. It should be measurable. At what accuracy will they demonstrate it? It should be attainable, so it should be based on what the child can already do and then build on that. It should be relevant, so that it's um, what will it look like when they've done it, um, and it should be time bound, so it's within six weeks or within. 10 weeks or within a year such and such will be doing such and such. 
So it's important that there's that they are smart. And if you're not sure if you've got smart goals on your IEP, um, ISP, ICP, um, you can always run them past me. Otherwise, you know, have a think about can you see each of the SMART within your goal? If they're not a SMART goal, then how will you know the child has attained it? How are you going to assess whether it's time to move on to the next thing? Or is this a goal that's going to last them forever and therefore you're not really pushing the child, the expectation's not there. So it's really important that, that we do think about whether our goals are written with the idea that they can succeed and they will succeed in this and then we'll be ready to move on and we'll know that we have reached that goal. So the areas of focus on um, these documents is um, obviously the curriculum and daily living and safety, social emotional issues, behavioural um, issues, gross and fine motor adjustments and things, sensory issues and speech and language or communication areas. Um, each focus area identified should look at the impact and the adjustment or the strategy that's going to be employed. Within an ICP, the differentiation and accommodations should be outlined. Um, and the ICP is the individual curriculum plan, so it should be stating what level the child will be operating at in each subject. So Susie um, will be accessing year three, but producing at a prep level. The learning expectations, so it's going to be specific around, you know, if they're doing rhyming or poems and that sort of thing, what will it look like for Susie? She's going to still be accessing the same, um, the same core curriculum, but she's going to produce it at a different level. What teaching strategies are you going to help her to get to that um, expectation or that goal? What supports is she going to need? And then it should include um, a list of who was at the meeting and their approval, so their signature. And if you've got, if your school's got I, ICPs that haven't been signed by you or you weren't in, um, weren't in on the meetings, then I would recommend, you know, approaching them and saying, you know, when's the next meeting? When can I come? Be proactive in making sure you are involved in these um, times. Key considerations when writing these documents is to know the child, have a student profile, to talk to previous teachers. If the student's got a vision statement prepared by um, the family, then to have that always in their file as well, to always be referring back to it, have it as the front cover. This is what this child is destined for. You know, this is what we want to see. We want to work backwards and make sure the child is able to be a productive member of society. You want to make sure you're looking at previous ones and you're building off what's already been done so we're not re redoing what they did last year just because we didn't bother to look at the old one. You've got to make sure you're building off the goals and you're following ACARA when you're looking at curriculum, the Australian curriculum, and you want to be moving them forward. You want to try and get them up to speed as much as possible. So if you can move them, move them faster than they need to be. Use the knowledge of parents. Parents know their child the most, so make sure you're utilising their knowledge. They might have seen them do things at home that you haven't seen in the classroom or in the school. doesn't mean the child can't do it. They might just not be confident enough to do it in the classroom. So, you know, discussing some of the, um, some of the areas that you're concerned about and asking parents if they've got the same concerns. No, they're showing this at home. Okay, great, that sort of thing. And the, the culture of low expectation that's rife within um, the community and we need to just make sure that we have high expectations that our students can and will learn and that we need to make sure we have that expectation, the school has that expectation, all of the um, the the people involved in the education of our student have that expectation because that's the truth. Our students can and will learn and when we set high expectations, they will rise to them. When we have low expectations, they'll definitely hit them as well. So we've got some documents available on um, our website for free download. So we've got the vision statement, which isn't here, but you can download that one. And we've also got an exemplar of a vision statement. And then we've got the IEP meeting agenda, or that will be the ICP meeting agenda. So just making sure that, you know, you're staying on task and that type of thing. And um, then the who I am. So that's good to give to the new teachers. You know, this is the student. Um, this is what I'm good at. This is what sets me off. This is what calms me down. These are the medical issues I have, that type of thing. So have a look at our website and see what works for you and what doesn't and what you need to um, take with you to the meetings. 
<sighs> All right, down the bottom there you'll see a, um, a link. So um, you can go to that and that will give you more information on the individual curriculum plan from Education Queensland. It's important that even if a child is on an ICP, that the student is taught with their same age peers. We don't segregate them, we don't withdraw them, we don't even integrate them. They're taught the same content, the same um, expectations, that type of thing. But when it comes to what they produce, we can expect um, a different because it's um, written in the ICP as this is what they're going to do. Now I'm going to quickly um, run over the next few because I'm running out of time. But this is an example of a um, of a student's I, uh, um, ISP, a student plan. So you can see that the focus areas are personal safety, expressive language, receptive and expressive language. Nowhere, nowhere is it talking about the curriculum. It's giving you the strategies that they're going to use, who's responsible, and the evaluation. Here's an example of the ICP. So this one is looking at maths and English. And nowhere in here will there be things about health and that type of thing. It'll all be around how this student is going to access the curriculum and what the expectation is going to be at the end. It's important to monitor our ICPs or our ICPs, so that should say ICP monitoring. Um, so I've just created this where you just write the goals and so they might have a goal of maths or whatever and you and then during the week you can just um, be writing down a number or taking photos. So Seesaw is a wonderful app. There's other apps out there, um, Edmodo, that type of thing where you can take pictures of um, the students work and keep it for later um, collaboration. Otherwise taking um, photocopies and putting it in their file so that you have proof of their um, product throughout the term and not just relying on that summative assessment at the end. Sorry, that formative assessment at the end, sorry. <laughs> All right, that IEP monitoring sheet is also available for download on, but it should it'll say ICP. ICP monitoring sheet is also available for download on the Down Syndrome Queensland um, website. All right, from here you can just see how the development of the plan is um, looked at. So I'm just going to skip over this one. You can have a look at that in your own time. But you can see how it sort of is a circular motion, and then we go back to doing the case conference, which is that meeting that you would go to. Most schools will do an IEP meeting um, every six months. Some schools will might only do it once a year, but you can ask to do it twice a year. I wouldn't recommend um, approaching them more than that unless they're more than ready to sort of do that um, because usually the goals will be set for a semester type thing. So they'll look at the semester, set the English writing, reading goals for that semester, and then you'll go back. So normally, normally, quote unquote, they're done in term one and term three. So parent perspectives on ICPs, ISPs, um, a lot of parents find it a very, very stressful situation. So if you're a parent and you find them stressful and intimidating um, or you find that you get a little bit lost and that type of thing, you are um, not alone at all. But we need to be aware if you're a teacher or you're an inclusion coach or you're a hoses that this is how parents sometimes come in feeling and we need to put them at ease straight away. So often I say giving them an agenda or an example of some of the goals that you're going to be including before the meeting. So it gives them time to think, to, to ponder on whether they're happy with what um, you're giving to them. So for parents, we say to discuss areas where your child has, you've seen progression with your child and, you know, praise points like, wow, you know, I've really noticed that they, they're understanding their numbers so much more. Um, that type of thing. Keep to the positive side of things. Invite specialists if you want to. So think people like your speech pathologist or your occupational therapist if it's relevant. Um, if you get any more specialist reports of your child's progress in any of the above like the speech and the occupational therapy, always make sure the school has a copy of it and bring it to the um, meeting so that that can be incorporated into the program as well. If the family needs a friend or um, support or advocate, then 
you can bring one. It's okay to have one there. Just let the school know that you're going to be bringing someone else as well, especially for those families who've had those really negative experiences doing an ICP. They might just need that support there. Um, if if educators start using jargon, and we're really good at using acronyms because there's so many of them for us, um, just say, oh, I don't know what that means. Can you explain ICP? Or, or do you mind explaining what an EAP is? You know, just ask the question um, because we will do it without even thinking about it and um, you need to just stop us and say, oh, I don't actually understand that. Oh, okay, right, I can give you that. As I said before, having the child's vision statement and photo on the table is always a good idea because then you're reminding people why we're here. We're here because there's a human involved. This isn't, you know, a fight between two people trying to get the best outcome. There's a human involved and we want to have the best intentions for that child and their future. Um, have a list of your child's strengths and areas of your concern. Um, ask for an agenda prior to the meeting with what they're going to suggest as the goal so that you have time to think about it and um, and talk it over between yourself and your partner or, or whoever's involved in the child's life and um, to give yourself time to sort of think about it. So if they're um, one parent said the school's told me this afternoon is the ICP meeting. I've asked for the goals. They said they'll be there on the day. I said, okay, that's fine. But she'd had bad experiences. So I said, well, why don't you say to them, I'd like the agenda beforehand and then give me a week and then we can do um, the goal statement, that type of thing. So it's just about making sure that you are um, prepared and that you feel comfortable with the situation as well. All right, so here's an example of our beautiful boy, George, a vision statement. Um, there's a free template here, but as I said before, this is um, this is a Canva template and it can be tricky tricky to get to and I struggled to even change it. So as you can see in the writing, it's about his da a daughter. So what we've done is we've just created one in Publisher and we've made it um, accessible through our website and you can change it at will, add your photo in and that type of thing, it'll guide you. That's on our website. If you want um, specific information of how to get to there, let me know. Otherwise, just do a bit of a search under the education banner. And as I said before, if it's appropriate, give your child a voice at meetings by including them, asking what they want as their goals to be. So, you know, a child might have different long-term goals in us so he might really want to know how to read so our goal might be that he's going to focus on his reading for a semester or um, he might really want to understand money so you know we'll spend a semester spending some time on their money whereas we might have different things in mind so it's important when appropriate and when age appropriate um, to give that child a voice and include them in the meetings. It's not, it's, you shouldn't be saying anything that the child can't hear, doesn't know is already happening and that type of thing. All right, so that's kind of the end of our school um, issues or concerns or questions. If I haven't touched on your question, you can always shoot me an email at education at downsyndromeqld.com, no, .org.au, that's education at downsyndromeqld.org.au. Here's a list of all the references that um, were in here. But again, a lot of our downloads are available on the website. So just hop onto the website and have a scroll through the education resources. Um, if you want a copy of the PDF of this, I can send it to you. Just email me. Otherwise, if you've got specific questions, you want more information or you um, want to query or question anything, then again, just give me an e just shoot me an email. Email is the best way to get me. Um, otherwise, give the office a call. But thank you for coming and I hope that this has answered some of your questions.